All right, so Paul, now imagine, and again, we don't have one that we think has our name on it. How are we going to get back at them? Or how do we get back, you know, stick it to the asteroids because of the dinosaurs? Okay, so let's imagine that someone tomorrow finds an asteroid that's coming straight towards us. Okay. That's the plot of a vast number of movies <laughs> and science fiction films. Um, it's, it's often one person discovers it and tries to tell the world. That wouldn't be what the case. They would say, well, it's got an orbit that might overlap the Earth. They'd ask everyone else to track it down. And then as more and more data came in from observatories around the world, they'd say, oh, shit. Yeah, it would actually be about 40 different groups saying, uh-oh. Yes. Uh, now, most likely, at least if it's a big one, we're going to spot it decades to centuries ahead of when it hits. That's right. We're not going to see one that's going to hit tomorrow. Yeah. It's going to be in the year 2349, something is going to hit us. And again, this is the principle because the bigger it is, the more light it's reflected, the easier it is to find. Yes, so the big ones, the, the kill the world ones, odds are we're going to see them a long way away. Yep. And we'll have plenty of warning. Yep. It could be we see one like two hours before it hits, but those are going to be the small ones most likely. Yeah. Because they're so small, we're only going to see them in the last few minutes when they get bright enough to pick up. And small, we're talking about the size of Chebulids, where it could do a bit of damage to a city, but we're not talking about even yeah. destroying the city. Yeah. So the, the scenario of a really big one being caught at the last minute, I mean, it could happen if it's coming out of the sun. Um, it's but it's, it's highly, 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 highly unlikely. Normally, we're going to get a lot of notice. And yeah. so let's say you've got a lot of notice. What do you do? Yep. I think most politicians do nothing for about 200 years and then <laughs> panic at the last 10 years. But, yeah. Let's um, assume we're at the last 10 years now. Um, and what you'd want to do is change its orbit. Okay. Now, if you're doing it a long time in ahead, it doesn't need to be a very big change of the orbit. Even a slight sideways nudge 100 years ahead is going to make a huge difference to where it's going to be. Because we're talking about things that are either very centric, very far away, very long orbit. So that, that nudge is enough far away to from the Earth to way beyond the Earth. Yes, yeah, like hitting a golf ball. If you get your angle up by one degree, it's, if you're hitting a long way, it's going to end up a long way away. That's right. So these things, if you've got to 200 years worth of movement, a very slight change of the orbit is all it takes to okay. deflect them away. So we need to do it early. That's the key. Early makes it easier. Yep. Um, this is something politicians are not very good at, but uh, let's try early to it easier. Uh, so how will you do it? At the moment, the consensus of the most technologically mature way to do things, to change an orbit, is just to smash something into it. Okay. Because we know how to build spacecraft and we know how to steer them. And so we also know how to smash things both on purpose and accidentally as well. Yep. And in fact, NASA have the mission called DART where they're actually trying this out. Yep. They've got a space probe that later this year, we're filming this in 2022, yep. um, is going to smash into one of actually an orbiting binary pair of asteroids. That's right, it's called the, the double asteroid redirection test. Yes, so here's the two asteroids. There's Dimorphos and Didymos, if I'm pronouncing that right. Yep. And that, these are not ones that are going to hit the Earth, no, or no, ever no. hit the Earth. Um, and, but the idea is that we're just going to try it out, see how it works. We're smashing into it, and because they're in a nice orbit, we'll just see how much the orbit changes and realize how much, da how much of an orbit change you can produce by smashing a spacecraft into it. In fact, this is one of the reasons why it was chosen, right? Again, not because it's dangerous, but because we can measure the change in its orbit relative to the bigger component, because we're crashing into the smaller one. And it's actually a pair that are edge-on from the Earth, yep. which means you, they, they cross each other. And so by looking at just the brightness from the Earth, you can see small changes in orbit, which is why it was chosen. Yep. So um, the, the change is going to be very small, but that's all we need. Yep. Uh, it's, it's uncertain because you're never quite sure when you smash something in, we don't really know how massive they are. That's right. And we don't really know how strong they are. Yep. Is it going to blow it to pieces or just change the orbit? I mean, something, all of these asteroids are probably very crumbly. Yep. And it could just turn into a cloud of debris, debris which, which still hits worse. the Earth. That's yep. right. <coughs> so it'd be like a cluster munition rather than just a single <laughs> bullet. So that could actually be worse. Yep. So we want to understand the things like how heavy they are, how much you can change their orbit, whether you're going to break them to pieces. So this is probably the easiest way. This is closest to what we have with current technology, which we know how to launch rockets and steer them, which is all you need for this. And again, this is a, a pure test to see, does it even work? And as you said, some of those initial questions of what happens when we purposely hit the asteroid? Because again, it's a long way to understand to making this a viable option, but it's at least a plausible option. That's right. People have talked about numerous other ways of doing That's things. Right. Um, one technique is the <laughs> gravity tug. Yep. The idea is you have your rocket that heavy rocket that sits in an orbit a bit to one side of the asteroid, probably an ion drive or something to keep it to one side rather than in a circular orbit. Yep. And what will happen is the gravity of the spacecraft will pull on the asteroid. Yep. 
Now, spacecraft are not very heavy. Nope. So the gravity of, if you're a spacecraft, you're not going to wrench me out of right. my orbit. But there'll be a very if small slowly tug, nudge, very slowly small tug. tug. And over hundreds of years, that might be all you need. That's right. And again, we, we, we can kind of do this, right? We can build rockets decently well. <laughs> we could probably build an engine that could do this. Yep. So this, uh, again, this, this needs a long lead time, but we're probably going to have a long lead time. So yep. for a long lead time, this might be enough to nudge it sideways. And it's beneficial because you never have to touch the asteroid. That's right. So if You're it's not really going to break it apart and have more of them. Yes. So this is, in some sense, especially for a very soft, crumbly thing. That's right. It's a good technique. There are other techniques. For example, you could spray paint half the asteroid white. Yep. Because the sunlight will then bounce off that side differently from the other side, which will give a small sideways force. Yep. Which, again, might well be enough to nudge it into a different orbit. And I think this is the important thing these are all things people said hey you know what option should we try today we do know these physical processes happen to asteroids naturally so it's kind of accelerating a natural process that's right now most people when they think about what we're going to do about asteroids they immediately think atom bombs that's right um and the trouble of course is it may well break an asteroid up and give us the cluster cluster that's right impact um but again it could work you might want to set off the atom bomb a distance away so it heats up one side of the asteroid and causes some of the gas from that side to burn off, giving it again a slight sideways nudge. Yep. So it's probably not try and blow the whole thing to pieces. It's more so much as nudge it sideways. Exactly. With gentle explosions off to the side to give it a small nudge rather than trying to blow it to pieces. That's right. Okay. But, but there again, also may just be more efficient ways of doing that same thing. That's right. So this is something that um, maybe we can do. Um, but the interesting question of, should we even bother now? Yeah. I mean, this is one of many low probability, disastrous things that can happen, yep. like pandemics and mega volcano eruptions. And the risk is now drastically less than it used to be in the past, because we've discovered most of the big ones, none of them are currently on a collision course. Because in fact, it is kind of like a lot of things, prevention is a lot better than panicking about the incident. So I mean, if I had to list things that worry me about wiping out humanity in the next thousand years, this is now fairly far down my list of priorities. Yeah, I kind of agree with that. In fact, more of the higher list ones are ones that we would create, even in space, yeah. rather than a natural asteroid. Yes, so I mean, I would worry about mega volcanic eruptions. It's probably not what you can do about them, yep. but maybe some research and whether you can predict, predict and maybe uh, drain the magma channels or something of that might be a more profitable use of your research money than asteroid interception. Um, pandemics. Yeah. We're in the middle of the COVID pandemic at the moment, and that certainly killed a lot of people. Yeah. Um, and so... And then if you think about, you know, how many people have died from COVID, it would actually take a relatively large asteroid to hit a relatively densely populated area to get the same amount of, you know, terrible impact. So again, as, as we talked about earlier, the people to damage ratio, so to speak, in size... And we're actually, having major yeah. pandemics that kill millions of people at least once a century. Yeah. So your odds of dying in that. And we know, for example, mega volcanic eruptions, yeah. that um, several of them have happened in at least recent geological period, and they can cause very huge devastation. That's right. Uh, so, and uh, the biggest risk is almost certainly what we do to ourselves in the sense of nuclear war or biological weapons or yeah. chemical warfare or something like that. So I'd say, well, no, no, this is something we could do something about. Yeah. So, I mean... It's relatively cheap in the grand scheme of things to do a, a bit of money investigating this. But the risk not, is very low. Not, the range is already much lower. That's right. It's not something I think you have to lose sleep over, but it's not something we should completely ignore. And as you said, yeah. a little bit of investment to prepare at least or have those long lead times gives us the best chance. Because if you have 300 years to think about something, you probably have 300 years to come up with a good solution. Yeah, so maybe a little bit of investment in it, but I would, I, I would, there are many other things that worry me far more where I'd put my, my money into risk amelioration about Saying as a person who likes these things. As an astronomer with a vested interest in this stuff, I still think there are many other things that keep me awake at night much more than asteroid risk.